Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for getting on early. We uh, are excited to be presenting tonight, but we're going to give everybody a little bit of time. Sometimes it's uh, tricky to get on, sometimes it's not. As you guys are kind of sitting here, I'm doing a little bit of mindless chatter, but uh, it'd be cool if uh, maybe you guys can start putting in the chat where you're from because uh, we could potentially be international. We've had people from uh, Canada that have signed up for this. You know, we've got some people from like Louisiana that have signed up. So we just like to kind of know where our audience is coming from. Oh, wow. We're all over the country already. <laughs> we got a Richmond, Virginia, a Mount Sterling, Ohio. Oh, there's our Louisiana friends. Hot Springs, Arkansas. Awesome. Fallon, Illinois. So the amazing thing about these webinars is we actually have access to people across the country. It's kind of neat. I know, uh, I guess the, the Michigan scene is pretty big. So I watch a lot of webinars from people in like Michigan, um, Iowa, Nebraska. It's, it's really neat to say you can get Basically, it's like attending a presentation, but virtually, which is sounds dumb, but it still fascinates me. That this is uh, working out. As everybody comes in, uh, we would love it if you can put where you're from in the chat. Looks like we got a lot of states already. We're located in Illinois, but we're right across the river from St. Louis, Missouri. So we have people from Missouri that'll probably be in here today too. Staunton, Illinois, a little jog up 55. I hope everybody's enjoying the weather around the country right now. Here in St. Louis, I think our high today was right around 60 and it was sunny all day long. I got to Spend some time on a hill prey on our property, uh, doing a follow-up spray for invasive species. That's after we did a prescribed burn back in March, and it was real pleasant. I was excited to see the response, and then also the response wasn't good, too, because those invasive species like to take advantage of that bare soil and get in there, too. But I'm trying to get them on there nice and small. Clinton County, Illinois. Awesome. Is that the home of uh, Ski Soda? I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Carl Allen Breeze and all yeah. that. Awesome. Yep. We still have a couple minutes, but we have people jumping in the room. If you guys don't mind, you can put your location in the chat. We have people from all over the country. I'm really hoping I see the, the Canadian attendees tonight. I just think that's kind of cool that we can reach that far. Maryville, Illinois. I've been there a lot. St. Peter's. I worked out there. I like the St. Peter's area. Bunker Hill. I think we have a former employee that is from Bunker Hill. Maryland Heights, Peoria. I haven't been to Peoria in too long. Romeoville. I'm not real familiar where Romeoville is. I know a lot of Illinois, but that one's just it must be somewhere up north. I've spent most of my time in central and southern Illinois. Got Narlands. Fenton's to so the other side of St. Louis from us. Also, Romeoville is north of Joliet. So, yeah, that's just a little bit outside of where I've done work in Illinois. Other Virginia. Awesome. Welcome everybody, we're, we're getting real close to time to start, but we're gonna allow a couple minutes for people getting on in the last second here. Right now we're filling up the chat with where we are from across the country. And I think you guys should be able to scroll up and down and see that we're a pretty diverse group. Good news is a lot of this native plant stuff, these principles, actually uh, they, they kind of span across regions. so. It's kind of the same stuff. You're just going to have different plants depending on where you're at. Mm -hmm. 
There's a St. Louis. What high school did you go to? <laughs> Hi, Leslie. Ha uh ha. -huh. Eric, <laughs> did you grow up in St. Louis? How do you know about that? Oh, I've been around for a while. I've, I've been on the Illinois side of the river, but we're, we're so close to one another. <laughs> yeah, so, that's the magic question. I'm not telling. <laughs> yeah. For people that aren't from the St. Louis area, that's a common St. Louis question. When you say you're from this area or that area, they'll say, oh, what high school did you go to? And it kind of helps us kind of pin down exactly where they're from. Because St. Yeah. Louis, between the city and the county, it's a... Uh, it's a little bit convoluted and hard to understand, but if you know the school, then you have a better idea. Oh, it's it's a good way to put a put somebody into a box. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't want to talk, talk about that part. <laughs> Eric, where are you from in Illinois? Granite City. You're from Granite. Okay. Yes, we have a very large steel mill in my hometown. But, uh, you know, I'm doing my best to kind of cancel out the bad that we do in our city getting better yeah well i mean it's just that steel mill and you know pollution and all that stuff all right what time are we looking at here we're up to 37 people i think we can kind of get going uh if you want to you can home of the warriors nancy marty my grade school principal <laughs> thank you <laughs> I'm in Mar Nancy <laughs> or Miss Marty. I don't know what to call you right now. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> All right. So we're going to get rolling here. Uh, in case more people add on, we, uh, we are going to be recording this tonight. So it will be available on YouTube tomorrow. We will send out a link with a bunch of other information too. Uh, let's, let me close out some stuff so I can see my slides a little bit better. Welcome everybody. I always leave this slide up first because uh, this whole deal kind of leads up to our wildflower market that's coming up on May 8th. Uh, we're kind of, we've always done a native plant sale, but now we're doing, we're kind of taking it to the next level where we're inviting some more vendors. And uh, you can see some informa information here, but I'll talk more about that in a moment. Let me figure zoom out real quick here. All right, there we go. All right, we're going to get this started for real now. So this is uh, part three of our native plant landscaping series. And tonight we're gonna to talk about native plant installation and maintenance. Uh, my name's Eric Wright. I'm the stewardship director here at the Nature Institute. And uh, I have my contact information on there. If you wanna tell me how great of a job I did, I love those emails. So <laughs> don't be afraid to send me an email sometime. All right, so now we're gonna do the Zoom equivalent to everybody stand up and meet themselves, except for it's gonna be way less awkward. So Ramona is gonna put a little poll on the screen. And if everybody kind of just look at the screen real quick and just answer the question with where it corresponds to you. We just like to get an idea of kind of where everybody's level is and just, you know, just a little general information. It's nice for us to know who's in the room, but it's also, I think it's nice for you guys to kind of gauge your, your peers here. All right, if everybody can just look at the screen, read those questions. Looks like a lot of people are already answering. Starting to add up. Awesome. We're up to 20 something. If anybody's multitasking, if you can just look at the screen real quick and answer the survey. We're up to 31 out of our 37 right now. Looks like we have a couple people still joining us. Awesome. Welcome everybody as you get in. We got a poll right now where we're trying to get in, we're getting to know each other a little bit here, Zoom style. All right, I'll kind of call it there. So have you been to the Nature Institute? Not very many of you had, and you're missing out because we got a pretty awesome uh, program. We got a pretty, pretty awesome organization here. So if you're ever in our area, please stop by and see us. Uh, native plants in the yard, it's pretty predictable. You guys are in a native plant webinar and a lot of people already have native plants. But I do appreciate the fact that we're always learning new information and getting new perspectives. Uh, t and I's native plant sale. We've got a couple people that have already purchased plants from us. Awesome. But we got a lot of plants, so we need more people to come to that native plant sale, too. It looks like the majority of people found us on Facebook, but some people went to our website or had it shared by a friend. Awesome. Okay. Let's take that poll down. And... We will get into the meat of the presentation. All right, so first things first, let's do our introduction. So we are the Nature Institute. 
Uh, we are located in Godfrey, Illinois, which is in the St. Louis metropolitan area. Uh, we are a not-for-profit organization. Our mission is to foster environmental awareness through education, restoration, and preservation. So during a typical spring and fall, we're just booked up throughout the week with field trips for different school-aged children. Um, we also do uh, special programming throughout the year for both children and adults alike, like tonight's webinar. Uh, we also have this awesome Discovery Day Camp that we run throughout the summer. And those are week-long sessions where kids can come out and they can play outside all day and learn a little bit about nature while they're here too. Another cool thing about us is we manage 450 acres and we're at Illinois, Na Illinois Registered Nature Preserve. Uh, so our land is permanently protected and we would like to provide a recreational activities for people. So we have hiking trails, lots of hiking trails, eight miles of hiking trails. And uh, because we're located on the bluffs above the Mississippi River, we have some great outlooks over the Mississippi River. You can actually see the, the St. Louis Arch from the top of our bluffs, which is pretty neat. Uh, we also have varying skill levels of hikes. So, you know, you can do a short little flat hike or you can, you know, dedicate a couple hours and go on a three plus mile hike. Uh, we have a couple, a couple waterfalls on the property that people really like to visit. Uh, great little Rocky Creek. It's, it's just a great place, and I encourage you guys to come out and see us if you're in the neighborhood. Uh, as I mentioned, we are a, a not-for-profit organization, and tonight's program is free, but we always do appreciate a donation here or there. And if you go to our webpage, you can see a donate button. Uh, we appreciate anything and everything we can get, and we try to maximize every dollar we can bring in. So behind the scenes tonight is Ramona, and uh, she's basically our administrator of the webinar. Uh, if I screw anything up, she'll help me fix it. There's Ramona back on the camera for a second. <laughs> and uh, also, she's going to kind of be monitoring the chat. I tend to kind of just keep kind of flowing the through the presentation. But if there's a question that's very relative, relevant at the time, Ramona will butt in and stop me and say, hey, Eric, so-and-so wants to know this. Uh, so this is our third part of our Native Plant Landscaping Series. We have one more coming up next or in two weeks, two Thursdays from now. And that one's going to be like a virtual tour of our greenhouse. So you can kind of see how we propagate our own plants here at the Nature Institute. And I have to take a moment to mention our sponsors. So back to my flyer slide here. Uh, we are not for profit, so we have to find some way to, you know, cover our expenses. Uh, we have a couple great neighbors, uh, Terry and Nazi Dueling, that just really support us, uh, both uh, with helping us with different projects, but then they also financially are helping our greenhouse this year. Uh, we have two local businesses that are great. We have a uh, Mississippi Mud Pottery. They do all kinds of cool handcrafted stoneware is what they call it. Uh, but, uh, you know, they have like kind of their pieces. If you just walk in, you can buy. But they also do a lot of custom stuff, custom stuff too. And they're down in Alton, Illinois. Uh, awesome in Alton, Illinois is Juniper Environmental. It is a woman-owned business. And if you're taking on kind of a bigger project, like say you want to plant a prairie in like a uh, corporate like field or something or you know, just something that's kind of just a little bit beyond a basic skill level, they're a great group to reach out to to kind of help you with those the projects. Uh, I do just kind of want to highlight our vendors here too. Uh, we have always done a native plant sale on our property and we've been pretty successful. We decided that maybe we can get even more plants into more people's yards. So we've partnered up with some of our other local native plant growers and they're going to come out to our wildflower market and sell plants alongside us. That way we can get more plants, more variety plants, and hope, hopefully more plants into people's yards. All right. So just a quick review of what we've done in this webinar series so far. Uh, the first webinar was just why native plants. And I love this light pollution picture that you can pull off uh, NASA.org, or I'm sorry, NASA.gov, because it kind of shows that, you know, you think you see a lot of wide open spaces out there, but it's looking at the light pollution. You can see how much humans have actually impacted our landscape. And one of the things we want to do is we want to bring more native plants into our yard so we can kind of possibly benefit the wildlife that still remains and hopefully build things back again to where we have a healthy environment. Uh, two weeks ago in our part two, we did native plant landscape design. So during this webinar, and both these are on YouTube already, we actually basically started from scratch and created this hypothetical project. And I kind of, we taught how to select your plants and we thought how to kind of draw your diagram and get your bloom periods and do everything all together. And it culminated in the uh, theory you see here. I highly recommend checking that out. Uh, I'm a big put the working on the front end kind of guy because it's going to equal better long-term success. 
All right, we're going to jump straight into the meat of the presentation now. So native plant installation is uh, one of the two topics that we're covering tonight. Excuse me, let me take a sip here. So the first thing you have to do no matter what is you have to prepare your bed. Uh, so, you know, you need to take a look around, see what you got going on. Uh, so do you have like existing landscaping? Uh, if so, you might need to re remove or move some plants to kind of make some room for your new native plants. Uh, weeding, we're not going to get away from the weeds no matter what we do. Native plants are low maintenance, but weeds are very opportunistic and you know they're always going to get in there. Uh, we also want to check out kind of the status of our mulch or rock. Uh, maybe we got a bird bath that needs to be replaced or we're going to add some more ornaments to our garden. So just kind of have that holistic kind of evaluation of your garden beds. Uh, if it's a new bed, so say you're turning some turf grass into uh, a little prairie planting, kind of like we talked about in our first in our second webinar there, uh, you're actually going to have to terminate the existing vegetation. This can be done by solarization. Um, you could also use herbicide as long as you kind of use it minimally. And uh, basically what you're trying to do is just kind of create a fresh bed that you can put new plants into. Uh, da, 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 remove dead plant material. So after you kind of kill everything off, whether it's some solarization or um, using herbicide, you kind of want to move stuff out of the way. It's, it will be easier to kind of see things and give your plants a little more room to grow. Uh, if you're starting a new bed, I kind of really encourage mulch. Mulch has its, has its disadvantages, but it also has a lot of advantages. They're going to make our project more successful and make us happier in the long run. Uh, one thing I do recommend is to not till up your soil. Uh, when you till up your soil, you're actually going to expose all kinds of weed seed and you might create more of a problem for yourself than you're actually helping yourself. All right, so we have our space evaluated. Now you have to find your plants. So here in the St. Louis area, uh, the Nature Institute is lucky to have all kinds of other great organizations that either professionally produce native plants or they just do it as part of what they do. So we have our five vendors are going to sell plants alongside us at the wildflower market. But I just kind of pulled uh, kind of the ones I hear a lot about on the internet and from friends and everything. And that's on the right side. And we have a local organization called Grow Native. And if you go to their website, they have all kinds of great information, but you can go to the resource guide and find different native plant vendors in our area. And their organization spans across Illinois, Missouri. So it's a great source if you're somewhat local and hopefully everybody across the country is something similar too. And if not, maybe you should start it. <laughs> all right, so selecting the best plants. Uh, I know a lot of stuff's gone online because you know our circumstances over the last year but uh, I'm a guy that I like to have that plant in my hand. And uh, one thing I do is I make sure I always go to a reputable, reputable grower. Uh, I wanna make sure they don't have a native R species versus a real true native. So a native R is basically when you take a native species and you start to kind of breed for the characteristics that are more desirable for you. And when you do that, you're kind of changing the genetic combinations within that plant. We could actually make it less appealing to the native species we're trying to benefit, like our wildlife, our um, uh, beneficial insects, our caterpillars, our butterflies. So you want to get something that is a true native versus a native bar. Uh, something else I always preach is a local ecotype is really good. So ecotype means basically it's the seed is collected near you. So when you have that happen, you know, we have like our purple cone flowers, which grow across a lot of the eastern part of the United States. Well, the climatic conditions here in St. Louis, in the St. Louis region where the Nature Institute is located, is different than say purple cone flower in eastern Michigan. And so if you have those local ecotypes, there's just a small adaptation. So those local ecotypes can handle those conditions a little bit better. Uh, we also want to make sure that there's no pesticides used. Uh, you know, it's hard to grow some plants and they'll use pesticides to kind of uh, help them get rid of the little critters that are munching on their plants. Well, when you put that plant in your yard, you might actually harm the stuff that you're trying to help. So make sure they're not using any crazy pesticides. So once you have your reputable grower and you get that plant in your hand, I always kind of do an evaluation of the plant. So, you know, everybody kind of looks at the foliage on the plant, the above ground biomass. And uh, I mean, some of our native plants look kind of wimpy in the beginning. So what I always do is I kind of Google, you know, X species seedling and I kind of compare it to the pictures. And so you want to make sure that it looks typical for the species and hopefully it's uh, looking really good for the species. Also, you can check the how well developed the roots are. Uh, that can be as simple as picking up the plant and looking at the bottom of the container. And if you have roots kind of coming out the bottom, uh, that's a good sign that that root system is well developed. 
if you have a well-developed root system, then your plant's more likely to thrive once you get it in the ground. Another general rule is a bigger plant is going to have a higher rate of survival. Uh, it's had that special attention just a little bit longer, and therefore when you put it in the ground, it's really going to take off. Uh, so little story as I was setting this up, uh, <clears throat> I just went into the clip arts in uh, Microsoft PowerPoint, and I just typed in strong plants, and it gave me this little cartoon of this muscle plant, you know, real cool. But then also in that same category, it gave me the purple coneflower that we see in this picture too. So I don't know if Microsoft knows it or not, but they know that they might know that native plants are real strong too. All right, so now it's time to start talking about cutting some dirt when we actually put our plants into the ground. Uh, you know, the general kind of guidelines are you want your hole size to be twice as wide as, wide as the pot size. So you want to dig out, give a little bit of extra space because you want your roots to both grow down and out so they can become fully established and therefore thrive into the future. Uh, you also want to make sure the root crown, which is basically the point where your root system meets the above ground bio, biomass, actually kind of you want to plant that root crown level or even with the top of the garden. And what I do for that is I take a yardstick out with me and I kind of lay it across my hole. And as I set the plant down in there, I make sure that that root crown is even with that ruler. Just a little trick that I use. It's really helped me out get my plants placed in properly. Uh, so I call it the fill and press method. You want to make sure that you kind of put that dirt back in around the hole. And then I always press it down real good. I've had, uh, I've lost a couple plants to where curious birds would just come in the next day and just be picking at those plants and they pull them right out of the ground. So I try to kind of push them in just a little bit to make sure they'll stay. Uh, when you, if you're using mulch, you want to keep mulch away from the root crown. Uh, if you have mulch next to the root crown, it can trap excess moisture and that could actually damage that root crown and kill your plant. So, I mean, I give, you know, a two to three inch little perimeter of bare dirt around each one of my plants. Uh, also something that's a standard practice is you want to water in your plants. So when you put your plants into the ground, you know, you just want to give them a nice good soaking and that's going to help kind of encourage those plants to grow. And I'm not talking about, I mean, yes, you want to directly water the plant, but I actually water the entire bed. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But because uh, then you want those roots to kind of reach out in all directions and become better established and therefore your plants will survive. So watering, uh, I always try to do something that I've never seen done before. So we'll see how this goes. Wish me luck, guys. So established native plants, they need little supplemental watering. Uh, they, goes, they have those deep root systems and they can, they can basically survive without any help from us, which is great. It's that low maintenance stream that we're all, we all have. Uh, however, new plants need a little help. Uh, I recommend it to give them one to two inches of water of rain per week. I also recommend that everybody gets a rain gauge for their yard so they can kind of see what what mother nature is doing for us so we don't have to <clears throat> so we don't have to supplement on some days and some weeks and everything. Um, I also recommend watering evenly across the entire bed and like I said you want those roots to spread out and down and just really kind of fill up and get all the water out of the the whole bed. If you don't have water in the whole bed, then they're just going to grow straight down where you're putting that water. So water the whole bed pretty evenly. All right, so a good question is how long do I water, right? And I don't know if many people think about this. I, I kind of think about this because we use a lot of herbicide at work and I need to be able to understand how much herbicide I'm applying. Well, this can actually, these same principles can apply to watering your own little garden bed. So if we want to calculate how much water we need to put on our garden bed, we need to measure a couple things. So the first thing we need to do is measure the rate of your hose output. And that's gonna, you're gonna record that in gallons per second. Uh, next, we need to know the area of our planting area. So that's uh, you know our garden bed or our planting area. And we're gonna measure that in square feet. Uh, we also want to kind of, we know our plants, we've designed our projects, we should kind of know the water needs of our individual, individual plants. And it's a little bit arbitrary, but you can kind of get a good gauge on how much water you think they need. So you're gonna just kind of set them, set an amount of water of like simulated rain is what we're gonna call it from here on out. <clears throat> okay, so step one of this process is you just take a five gallon bucket. You take it outside, you put the, the nozzle that you're gonna to use to water your plants on your hose and you fill up that bucket. While you're doing that, you're gonna start a stopwatch at the beginning, and when that bucket's full, you're gonna shut it down. And what I did out behind our shed at the Nature Institute is I just filled a bucket up with our hose. We actually have a pretty good water pressure, and the five gallon bucket was filled in 42 seconds. So that's our first calculation we need to measure how long we need to water our plants. 
So the next thing we can do is just measure the garden bed, uh, get out there with a tape measure. It's good to kind of just know how big your area is in the first place. Uh, so just measure it out. You know, you might have to do a little bit of geometry here and there, but it's gonna pay off in the end because you're gonna be better at taking care of your plants. So in our last webinar, we did this little design, this hypothetical design, and we created a 10 by 10 square. And so for this intensive purpose or this example, we're gonna use this design and that's gonna be 100 square feet. So now we have to kind of set the ideal amount of rainfall for your planting. So in our hypothetical design we did two weeks ago, uh, it was kind of all plants that kind of like moderate, not necessarily dry or wet, but it's kind of like that middle ground. And so we're gonna say that we wanna make sure our plants have at least two inches of water per week. All right, so now it's time for some math. Um, I like math, I'm not afraid to admit it. But uh, so I kind of wrote out the stuff we've already measured. So our hose rate was the five gallons to 42 seconds. I'm gonna sign a letter to that to make it easier for us to understand. And this will all come together and I'll simplify this in the end guys, but I just kind of want to run through it. Uh, so we have the area of our garden bed and we're gonna do that as an A and it's a hundred square feet. And we're doing that based off our uh, hypothetical project we did two weeks ago. And then S is going to be the simulated rain. So that's that, that amount of rain that we think that our plants need. So the first thing we need to do is we have the square footage of our garden bed and then we have two inches of rain we need on top of that. So you're actually measuring a volume versus, you know, an area or even a height. So to calculate that, all you got to do is multiply your area times your simulated rain, which is, you know, the two inches of rain that we desire. So if we simply put in our 100 square feet, and we multiply that by two. We also have to divide it by 12 because we have to convert the inches into feet. We get that our garden bed will require 16.667 cubic feet of water in a given week. Well, we wanna convert that now because we're measuring in gallons on the other stuff. So I just got on Google and I found the conversion factor to convert gallons to cubic feet. And we end up, our plants need 124 gallons of your strap for cash and you're really washing your water. This might be another number to really think about. So next, all we have to do is we have to apply our rate of our hose to the equation and we end up with, okay, in a given week, we need to water this hypothetical garden bed for about 17 and a half minutes with our hose with our nozzle on it. So you can do that, I mean, maybe all at once, but I would say in the beginning, what I would do is kind of split that up over, you know, three or four days and just kind of keep track of the rain on top of that too. So, you know, you can do five minutes every other day and then just check, see what the rain is that week. Uh, I did simplify it even further. So I created a little equation and this is uh, basically all the measurements that we talked about at the beginning with their uh, given units. So we need our area and we're gonna multiply that by the simulated rain that we're trying to accomplish. And then, we're multiplying that by this 0 0.01039. And that's just where I, where I did all those conversions from cubic feet to gallons and whatnot. I just made that into one constant number. And then you divide that by your hose rate, which we're doing in the gallons per second. And so say if you desire that two inches of rain per week, but you had an inch and a quarter, you can kind of guesstimate it. But if you want to be real precise to make sure you're playing, so that you're watering your plants how you want to, you can actually calculate it by throwing in this in, in this equation. And this is a good time to remind you that this will all be on YouTube. So if you want to watch how I did this again and maybe double check my math because nobody's perfect, uh, you will be able to do that probably tomorrow, mid-morning to afternoon. Okay, so we got our plants in the ground. We figured out how we're going to water them throughout the year. The other thing with watering is obviously during the summer, if you have those long, hot, dry spells, you might up your water from, say, two inches a week to like four inches a week. So you spend a little more time giving them water. Uh, once you kind of get to know your plants, you'll get a better feel for it, but it's good to just kind of have that baseline to work off of. So we're gonna go through some pretty pictures here. So this is one uh, planting I did multiple years ago, and uh, you can just kind of see that it, it looks pretty puny. I was lucky to get the woodland phlox in there, and it was like a good initial bloom, and I didn't scare people off with that. But if you see all the plants in the background, they're pretty puny, and uh, people were asking me, are you sure this is gonna work, Eric? Well, a couple years later, add a little mulch and kind of take care of the plants. And now we got vibrant green vegetation. I have my wild columbines blooming right there. Uh, this, this garden looks great. This is from the other direction, obviously. But uh, so this is just examples. Next up, so my brother 
puts a lot of faith in me and he let me do a little project for him. He's got a real shady front yard. So we kind of found some plants that would be ideal for his landscaping situation because he wanted to convert a little area to native plants. And uh, we did our design, I actually did this using software because it's a little bit easier for me, but I know everybody doesn't have access to the software. So that's why we did the native plant design two weeks ago. So he put all the plants into the diagram here. And after about a month, uh, he was kind of questioning what was going on in here. It didn't really look like it was gonna do much. But as of, I think it was yesterday, they sent me this picture and that space is really getting filled out. Look at that green vibrant vegetation and these plants are eventually going to all collapse into each other and you have a different flow of textures, blooms, bloom periods, and it's just going to be a great design. And I can't wait to see it when it comes to full fruition because this is probably, probably about three years when it is when it will be like fully established in full blooming glory. Uh, some of the plants you put in the first year, they might they might look a little spindly. So this is a Culver's root, and they, we got lucky. It bloomed the first year. Some plants aren't going to bloom the first year. This one did, but it didn't really look fantastic. So, you know, my this was in my parents' yard, and they were, they were questioning what I was doing to their yard. But then after a year, now we have this plant that's over five foot tall, several beautiful white spikes. The pollinators love this plant. And you can see the other native plants next to it. We got a gray-headed coneflower on one side, on the right side, and on the left side is a prairie blazing star. So once these plants get established, you're gonna you're gonna get to enjoy them growing up and becoming, you know, the plant they were meant to be. All right. So maintenance. Let's talk a little about maintenance now. Installation. We're there. We got to watch the plants grow through pictures, and now we're gonna start talking about maintenance. I'm gonna talk about weeds all the time because, well, you're not gonna stop your weeds. Um. Prevention is the best way to do it. So in my picture here, uh, this is a beautiful butterfly milkweed that's blooming in my buddy's yard. And uh, he's got some weed problems, but if he got in there and actually, you know, pick those weeds out for 15 minutes, then it would all be clean again. Uh, basically with your weeds, you're gonna have to pull them. Uh, you could maybe put some cardboard or over them to solarize them if you can't get them out of the ground, or you could spray if you can be real careful not to spray your plants. Um, once again, I'm a proponent of a mulch. We'll talk about why it's not always the best idea later. Uh, but another cool thing you can do is, so with some of my designs, what I've tried to do is basically pack the plants in so tight that they don't allow any light to get down to the soil. And therefore you're gonna pre prevent weeds from growing that way. And this idea is called the green mulch idea. And basically if you can pack in your plants tight enough, they're gonna take up all the resources and you don't have to worry about those weeds as much. So in our hypothetical project here, as we kind of built the project, we did the square footage of each individual plant on this. And the planting area is 100 square feet, but we ended up with basically 124 square feet of plant matter. So we have more plants than should actually fit in the space. But we're hoping they all grow so closely together that they're gonna prevent the weeding in the future. The initial design is meant to have mulch all the way around it. I've created a little buffer that would all be mulched too. But after maybe that first year, we only mulch the outside. And then as we go into the future, maybe we can mulch less and less and less. So tall plants, our prairie plants are, uh, especially here in the uh, tall grass prairie region, they're, they're very tall. Uh, the picture here is me standing next to a yellow giant hyssop that uh, I promised my buddy would not, it would not cover his window, but uh, I'm six foot two and that plant is towering over the top of me. It's probably eight foot on the minimum, if not nine foot tall. Uh, he really likes it because the, the birds and the butterflies are all over it, but uh, you might have to deal with some tall plants. And what we do for that is we, we, we stake our plants and we tie them up. So you can use bamboo stakes, uh, aluminum garden stakes, and just some jute twine. I know they make like that special tape that's green that kind of blends into the foliage, but don't be afraid to kind of give your plants a little support. When these plants are growing out on the prairie, they're growing next to each other and therefore they kind of they grow up together they lean on each other so they don't need that extra support when they're growing kind of more individually or not in a big prairie then they're going to have a tendency to kind of lean over and fall when you put those stakes give them that extra support like they have the friends in the prairie you're actually going to make your planting look a lot better it's going to be more aesthetically pleasing i just put a little picture of the bamboo stakes uh you can pretty much find these anywhere i really like using bamboo stakes they're cheap they're easy i can break them in half kind of cut them to size um, it, you know, any garden store, uh, home improvement store has bamboo steaks if you, if you ask the right person. 
So pinching, uh, when I'm talking about pinching, basically we're talking about kind of giving our plants a little bit of a haircut because we don't want them to get as big. Uh, this is not a process that we use for all native plants, but uh, we can use it for a lot of them. And when you pinch, basically you're gonna remove up to two thirds of that plant. And it's gonna be so, it's gonna have such a strong root system that it's still gonna respond, but your end plant's gonna be a little bit shorter and there's some other things could happen too. Uh, for pinching, it's really about the timing of it. So if you have a plant that you want to try pinching because it gets pretty big and it blooms in say like mid-June or July, then you might want to pinch that plant back a little bit in say early May. But if you have a plant that's going to bloom like later into October, you can actually pinch that plant as late as the 4th of July. What I do recommend is, is as you kind of experiment and ask around to find out how, which plants you want to try pinching to make them a little bit shorter or see the response to it. Uh, you do want to water your plants after you pinch them. If you pinch them and then you go through a dry spell, then they're kind of bleeding resources when you first pinch them. So I rec recommend giving them a little bit of water to help them through the pinch. So this is back to my parents' backyard again. <laughs> They've basically let me use their yard as my little experiment area. And uh, this is a New England aster. Uh, it's just one plant. And what we did is I pinched it back, I think right around uh, Memorial Day. And then I pinched it again on the 4th of July. Well, what it did for the New England Aster is it caused each one of those individual stems to turn into two stems. And then when I pinched it again, those two stems turned into four stems. So this New England Aster ended up looking more like a shrub and it just had so many blooms on it. It was so beautiful, so long. I apologize for the terrible picture. I didn't play the sun very good on this, but this was just a brilliant display that was actually created by properly pinching this plant and ignore the butterfly bush in the front there too. Okay, so deadheading, uh, that's where you remove the flower after it's done with its blooming period. Uh, it, in some species, uh, basically you do your research and find out if you can deadhead the species or not. But in some species, like say a black-eyed Susan, you might get a second set of blooms as a response to that deadheading. Uh, also, you have to consider that when you deadhead the plants, you actually could lose some wildlife value. Uh, you know, the, the wildlife is actually going to depend upon the seeds that are produced by that, by that plant. So if you pinch off the flower heads, you know, then you're losing that seed also. Da, 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 da. This is a great technique for aggressive self-seeders. Uh, so in my picture here, this is actually an example of both staking and deadheading. And it's not a true deadheading, but I remove the seeds before they're able to drop to the ground on this plant. This is an Illinois bundle flower. Uh, you know, once again, in my parents' backyard. <laughs> and uh, this thing, this thing went nuts. It's about six foot tall and it throws up those little white balls of uh, flowers. It's a pretty awesome plant. And the seed has, the seed production is actually really cool looking too. But I know from personal experience that this plant will self-seed and it will self-seed rather aggressively. So when it goes to full seed, I pinch off all the seed heads and just make sure that it can't, oh shoot. Sorry, technical difficulty. You guys give me one second here, I'm sorry. My charger for my laptop was not plugged in all the way, but we're good now. Uh, so yeah, and then also this plant got so big that we staked it up. Uh, to do some research on your given plants to figure out if you need a deadhead or if you want a deadhead to prevent the aggressive self seeders. What's next? Okay, so we've been through the whole growing season now. Our plants bloomed. We were so proud of them. Uh, now we're going to enter the dormant season. So your plants kind of die back. They're going to come back next year, especially if you have all perennials. But uh, you yeah, might have a little problem. So I always recommend that you leave as much of that plant as you can tolerate. Uh, during the winter months, you're going to provide food for birds. And also in the stems of your native plants, there's different beneficial insects and pollinators that are overwintering in those stems. So if you start to cut everything out, you're removing the source of food for birds and you're also killing some of the insects that you're trying to draw in. So wait as long as you can for your uh, cleanup or clean up as little as you can too. So one way that you can kind of, or this, I'm sorry, this is an example of another project that I worked on with my friend Katie. And we had, this is an ideal situation for a planting. Uh, it was south side of the house, uh, full sun, and it's kind of the typical St. Louis streets where it, the house sits up on the hill and then it, the hill drops down to the street. Well, so we have this great dry planting. I love this design. 
and Katie did a really good job. She just let it be. And you can see this is after this is after one full year, one growing season, that it really didn't look too messy. And I guess none of our neighbors complained about it either. So if you can get away with kind of just leaving things the way they are, that's going to do the greatest benefit for the wildlife around us. So if you have to clean some things up, if you just can't stand the appearance or say you're a business, you know, you have to have a presentable front of your building or for various reasons, if you have to cut some back, try to cut your stems back to about 12 to 18 inches. So this will allow some of your insects that are inside those stems to kind of survive that, survive those stems still. But it also creates a, you know, future habitat because the, the cut ends of those stems can be a nesting place for a lot of our native bees. Uh, and when you have those stems kind of sticking up, I tend to do this in uh, April, even into like early May. Uh, but what it's going to do is your new growth is going to come in so quickly, especially on an established plant. This is going to cover up those stems. You're not even going to know they're there. Uh, if possible, when you start to cut off all these stems, uh, maybe don't throw them on a burn pile or don't throw them in the trash. If you can kind of put them off to the side somewhere, it might help, uh, you know, maybe the birds will find that little pile of seeds you have sitting there now. Or maybe some of the native uh, insects that are inside those stems can actually survive still in that pile. So if you can hide them off to the side, that'd be great. So here at the Nature Institute, we have a couple of different little projects where we have to keep it a little bit neater. So we have this sign under that's on this kiosk and it you know, points people in the right direction to us and everything. Well, I have to maintain these plants by basically I pinch it's Perry Mountain Mint in the middle. I have to keep that nice and low. I have some great gray-headed coneflowers growing there, some prey drop seed, and it's great. But if you look at this picture, you can kind of see it looks a little rough, but you can also see the green vegetation coming up from the bottom. And I have all those stems cut off just low enough to where it looks a little more presentable, but it's, I'm also not getting rid of them all together. Uh, this is the little garden next to our greenhouse. And uh, you can't really see it too great in the picture, but I did the same thing here where I cut the stems down to about 12 to 18 inches. And you can already kind of see that, that green vegetation is going to top those any day now. Um, I obviously need to add some mulch to this project. I do a lot of weeding the other day. I actually got frustrated and just started putting buckets over the top of my plants. And I used a little bit of herbicide to get rid of all these weeds. And mulch will be applied soon because I want to work smart, not hard. Dividing and transplanting. Oh, shoot. I forgot to add my picture on this slide. Um, so our native plants, depending on the species, can be divided and transplanted uh, relatively easy. Uh, the best time to tr uh, transplant most species is while they're not actively growing. So over the winter months, uh, late in the fall, early spring, always good time to transplant a plant. Uh, you can also, <laughs> once you dig these plants up, you'll see that some of them, you can kind of hack up that big root ball into different pieces and divide that plant with relative ease. Uh, getting the plants back in the ground pretty quickly and giving them, you know, the right amount of water is going to help your success with this. And just make sure you research your plants. But uh, I had a picture that I forgot to load up. Uh, my father took that New England aster that we saw in the previous picture, and he divided that one into five different plants. They all thrived. It was no big deal. And then he decided he wanted to try it with his rigid goldenrod, and he divided that into another four plants. And now he's creating kind of a green a living hedge of native plants along his back fence so you can't see the alley where, you know, it's, it's an ugly little place, but he's gonna cover it up with beautiful native plants. All right, so now we're jumping into the next growing season. Spring has sprung and we're ready to start working our garden. We're jumping a year into the future. So we're in 2022 right now, guys, welcome. Uh, so you're gonna have to continue to weed, uh, you know, uh, just get rid of some of those plants. Uh, you also want to kind of be familiar with your plants when they're seedlings because you might have some self-seeding that you don't really want. Uh, you can weed those out just like they're a bad guy because a weed by definition by definition is a plant where you don't want it. So don't be afraid to pull out some of those good ones. Uh, a lot of people locally actually like reach out to friends and say, hey, I have this plant that's self-seeded. Would you like some of them? And you can just dig them out and give them to a friend. Uh, this is also a great time to kind of touch up your mulch. Uh, this is an optional thing. Hopefully after the first year, your plants will become so established that they're hopefully going to choke out a lot of weeds. Uh, and the problem with mulch is a lot of our native bees are actually ground nesting bees. So if you have mulch over everything, then you don't have that bare earth for, our, for the native bees to nest in. So if you can kind of slowly move away from mulch, that's great. But for a tool to keep your planting looking good and make it successful, it's uh, definitely a good idea. 
Uh, and then watching your plants return. So I'm sure a lot of you have your native plants in your yard already and you've noticed that some of them have been up for a couple months already. Other plants, I'm still waiting a couple of my plants to pop up. I know that for sure. And just be patient. It's kind of cool just to kind of get a feel for when these plants come up. Uh, and also if you have a great design like we did a couple of weeks ago at our uh, native plant webinar or our plant design webinar, uh, if you have that that diagram and you can like really look to see where all your plants were, you're not going to forget where you put it. So I always encourage everybody to kind of have a plant in a diagram because then you can kind of wait for that plant to come up. And when it doesn't, well, you can come to the Nature Institute's wildflower market and you can buy a replacement plant from us or one of our multiple vendors. <laughs> all right. So I want everybody to just always be learning about these native plants. Obviously you're here and you're doing the right thing already, but I just, you know, you're gonna forget stuff and then just continue to do your research, uh, look up all your plants. So today I wanted to just, you know, pull up a plant profile. So I went to the Missouri Botanical Gardens plant finder and I tried to put in uh, what we call bottle gentian on this side of the river. Well, over there, they have a different common name, the closed gentian. Uh, but luckily I knew the scientific name, which is uh, gentiana andreaceae. And I pumped that into the system and okay, I learned they actually called a closed gentian over in Missouri. So maybe I should just use the uh, scientific name on this one instead. And the Missouri Botanical Garden has these awesome like little baseball cards of these plants. Just all the information, quick and easy to access. Uh, I just use my little snipping tool to kind of cut this one out. And uh, you can do that for all your plants if you want. Just kind of keep a file of all the different little baseball cards of your plants. Uh, I mean, you guys are already doing a lot of good because you're here, but finding like-minded people in groups is a great idea. Um, you know, here in the St. Louis area, we have all kinds of other great conservation organizations. Uh, you can become a member of those or you can become a, a member for us. And we will continue to do stuff like this. And we want to, you know, we, we enjoy talking about it too. It's not like we're just doing it because I guess it's our passion or whatever, <laughs> but we, we actually enjoy our plants. So, uh, uh, the St. Louis Wild Ones comes to mind. We have the St. Louis Audubon. We have all kinds of different groups. Uh, we have the Grow Native group here in the St. Louis area. And I'm sure across the country, there's all kinds of people that are really enthusiastic about this native plant movement. Uh, I'm also on a lot of different Facebook groups. Uh, some of them are very, very specific to our region. Like we have the uh, St. Louis Native Plant Swap group. And we also have the Metro East Native Plant Gardeners group. I'm members of both those and I just love seeing people's different projects and the different questions because some of the questions that pop up I'm like oh I've always wondered that too and there's you know as a community we have so much information and so much knowledge that you know on Facebook the you get the answer <laughs> uh, obviously you guys are here so you're doing the right thing but uh, I would encourage you to continue to watch webinars and presentations uh, a lot of conservation groups have got really good at doing these webinars and I appreciate all the content that I'm able to watch uh, also check their YouTube channels. So a lot of people have YouTube channels now, including us. Uh, you know, this is our thumbnail for our YouTube video from two weeks ago. You can find it on our, on our YouTube channel under the Nature Institute and it'll be our logo, which I, is the sun with a little bird on top and everything. And that's all I really have for you guys. Let me check the time here. Yes, yeah, finished right about where I thought I was going to. So I haven't been checking the chat or anything, but there may have been some questions along the way. Uh, Ramona, have you noticed any questions that we could answer? Yeah, so we had one earlier in the chat okay. from one of our participants in New Orleans. Okay. Um, she said not to till up the soil due to low nutrients, but she has a heavy clay soil and high humidity, as well as a, a low water table there in New Orleans. Uh, she generally plants natives into the existing soil, but has some root rot. Do you have any suggestions? Ooh, root rot. So I guess the first thing to do is to make sure that you're planting the correct plant. So if I'm sure locally you have an organization similar to Missouri Botanical Gardens or something, somebody that does great content for you, and you can actually see different plants that can tolerate the, that soil conditions. Uh, I'm sure you have all kinds of crazy stuff with heat and moisture down there. So maybe if you can just find a different plant and you can kind of, you know, cycle through different plants and just, you know, figure out if you can move a plant to maybe a drier part of the yard or maybe a lower spot where it's going to stay a little bit wetter over a longer period of time. Any other questions in the chat or does anybody else want to make a comment or... 
had lots of excited comments about their plants coming up and some other suggestions for good groups. But if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Oh yeah, I forgot about, I actually went to a presentation at the uh, done by the Wild Ones in St. Charles. It was awesome, it was at the Weldon Spring Access area. Illinois Native Plant Society, I'm definitely a member of that Facebook group. Uh, that one, they're kind of really focused. It's not on the gardening aspect, but it's more about finding a plant out in the wild. And if you're like, I'm not sure what this is, that's a really cool group. Super excited. Purple cone flowers. Ooh, your butterfly milkweed is already popping up. Mine have not popped up yet, but I'm, I'm watching them. Let's see. What else do we have in this chat? What are your favorite Metro East native plant groups? Uh, native plant groups. Um, so, I mean, I've been to a lot of presentations done by the St. Louis Wild Ones. We have a gateway greening, gateway greening, I think it is. Um, and basically, especially if you know how to abuse the algorithm with Facebook, once you kind of start like saying, I'm interested in this event, I'm interested in that event, all kinds of stuff will pop on Facebook for you because you're basically training Facebook to do what you want at that point. Uh, Mobot has so many things that goes around it. There's, I mean, Grow Native is a, Grow Native is a great group. Uh, and they're affiliated with Mobot and the Missouri Prairie Foundation. I'm not sure all, all the structure works on that. Uh, both the Missouri and Illinois Native Plant Society are great groups to look into. Uh, I think these are all not-for-profits too. And, you know, me working for a not-for-profit, I, ooh, Deep Roots and KC. I have not done that. I haven't heard of that one yet. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, join these groups too. You can go to the presentations and everything. A lot of people do free stuff. But just remember to kind of, support your local not-for-profits because uh, times are rough right now and we can take anything we can get, so. All right, so we had somebody that asked for a recommendation for a sunny, dry area. And then there's also, and I think you can probably tie these together, recommendations for where to buy native plants besides TNI. <laughs> so I had that other slide up earlier, I can, Go back to it. Oh, this is gonna take too long. We're gonna do it the other way. So locally, these are, I'm not really endorsing anybody, but I do have Missouri Wildflowers Nursery on here. And these are just some of the, uh, some of the places that I've, I've, they're making a lot of noise out there. And we have our vendors on the left side here. And then on the right side, just some other ones that I know are doing good things. I've uh, been to Rolling Ridge and like I know uh, I think Pure Our Natives actually wholesales to Rolling Ridge. Uh, it's pretty awesome. Bones Farm is also another wholesaler. So if you got a really big project, they'd be a great one to reach out to. Missouri Wildflowers, I don't know how they do it. They they reach pretty far in all directions. I think they're in Jefferson City, Missouri, which is kind of centrally located. And they make it all the way over here to St. Louis. They do a lot of work in Kansas City. And just everybody knows about Missouri Wildflowers Nursery. They've been doing it for a while and they do a great job. Uh, Pap Papillon and uh, Green Safe Gardens are a little bit newer to my knowledge to the scene and I'm actually going to visit both those on Sunday just because I'm curious. <laughs> Prairie Hill Nursery near, near Columbia, cool. I'm going to have to take just like a road trip to see different native plant nurseries around our area. Oh and you are also asking about dry plants. Uh, I don't know if that was somebody who was local but uh, let me drop out of this for one second. Oops. Let me get my stuff together. So my friend Katie's planting. Where did I have that slide at? Terry's from the Metro East area, so a local. Okay. So my friend Katie's yard, where I was talking about that great kind of sunny area. Uh, it's probably pretty small on your screen, but like for that area, we did some uh, prairie coreopsis, we did butterfly milkweed. These are all kind of plants that can tolerate drier conditions. Uh, we have uh, lead plant, purple prairie clover, uh, pale purple coneflower, little blue stem, showy goldenrod, aromatic aster. So any of those plants, I kind of, I, I pick those plants because of the conditions. So any one of those would be great. And if you go to the, uh, there's the grow native plant picker, and then the Missouri Botanical Garden plant picker, you can actually input those, those conditions and it will populate you a list of plants that can tolerate those conditions. Uh, it's a really cool tool and uh, you can really spend a lot of time playing around with it. And I highly recommend just making, doing your research 
Uh, I can tell you the plants, but if you kind of find them on your own, it might make, might make it a little more fulfilling. And then once you have the plant selected, then you can reach out to all these local native growers and figure out who's got what plant. Because here at the Nature Institute for the wildflower market, I think we're going to end up producing approximately 45 to 50 different species. But there's five, six, seven, I don't even know how many different native species that could tolerate the conditions in our area. So all the different growers are going to be able to grow different plants. So buy them from us if you can, but don't be afraid to buy them from another good reputable grower too. Can you walk through again how to find the plants on the Botanical Garden website? Uh, I would love to, but that was a little bit of a process last time we did it. Um, so in the, the previous webinar, which you can find on our YouTube channel, uh, it's going to be in the follow-up e email. I think it was in the beforehand email. But uh, if you watch that presentation, you kind of, I we build it, we literally build it from scratch. We, we take notes, uh, we select our plants based off the two different tools we talked about earlier. So if you rewatch that design your native plant project uh, webinar, it's gonna show you everything you need and at least give you a good foundation to kind of create your own project. Yep, there it is. Thank you, Ramona. You're welcome. And Thomas, are you uh, local to the St. Louis area? Yes, I am. I'm in uh, Eureka. Eureka? Oh, yeah, that's, that's definitely close enough. You're almost, you can go to Missouri Wildflowers or you can come over to the places in St. Louis or even Illinois, too. Um, yeah, so I would highly encourage to kind of go through that webinar. Uh, you can kind of scroll across the bottom. You can see when I start getting into doing the research on the plant. But I walked through each step. And if I had more time tonight, I would love to show you exactly how to do it. But we kind of dedicated an hour to this, and I don't want to go too far over that. <laughs> so check it out on the, the previous webinar, and we'll send okay. that follow-up email for you. All right, thanks. Awesome. Great question, Thomas. That's uh, knowing your plants and knowing how to find your plants and, you know, design your project, I think is just as important. And for me, it's just as fun as actually watching the plants grow, because then I have a plan. And did it work? We'll see. <laughs> All right, do we have any more questions that I missed out on? You guys are a very knowledgeable group. I like how everybody kind of throwing out the suggestions. Uh, you know, we all know a lot of stuff and it's great to kind of put that collective knowledge together and, you know, we're gonna make the world a better place here. I'm just scrolling up the, the top. Why clean up at all from Leslie? Well. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. You, we don't want to make our, our neighbors angry and kind of make them shy away from native plants because our yard looks too messy. So in some instances, uh, you know, you might need to ease them into it. And then maybe once you get, you know, you have a great garden and they see how awesome your plants are doing, maybe they ask native plants and then they'll deal with the same struggles that you're dealing with. When in the spring, I think I said April is a good time. If you can wait later into the year of cutting back your vegetation, that's great. But uh, April's kind of a good good month to get it going. And that's typically where you're gonna start adding plants to. Okay. All right, you guys were awesome. Thank you so much for coming in tonight. Unless we have any more questions popping up, I see one new message. Down here. Oh, thank you for the compliment, Marsha. I appreciate it. I hope I made my grade school principal proud tonight. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I think we're going to call it for the night. If you want to rewatch this, we'll have it up relatively quickly on uh, YouTube and we'll send, we'll follow up with an email tomorrow. I'll probably add a couple more resources on there for you just so we can, uh, you know, just so you have it on hand if you want to share it with a friend. Uh, Please let everybody know that, you know, this is what we do here at the Nature Institute and uh, tell, you, tell your friends about the, the wildflower market. We're hoping it's going to be a big hit and we're excited to see everybody in person. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much.